Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see everybody here today. I'll direct your attention to the back of your bulletin. There's a few announcements this morning. It's a girl! That's, I'm reading it as it's written. So. October 7th, there's going to be a baby shower for Caitlin Scott and baby number two at 11 a.m. It'll be RSVPing by September 22nd, which is days ago. Um, whoops. Uh, to Candace Bird, her number's written in the, in the bulletin. Maybe there will be a crazy for your neighbors. Okay, that's fine. So, probably today. If you want our speaking to go to the baby shower, you probably should reach out today. Uh, October 15th, which should be... So October 
we're going to take that Sunday is United Women of Faith Sunday. All functions on this day will be brought to us by the ladies of our church. In the pulpit will be Ms. Margaret Fisher, Acolytes with Ms. Katie C. and Candace Bird, the liturgists of the Wick Endeavors, Ushers, Phyllis Haddock, and Grace Manning. Greeters, Reverend Corey Alexander Lett and Diane Austin. Join us for some special music and a special, me special message as we celebrate. A note from Anne's Closet. Thank you for your generous donations. Over the past two weeks, you have contributed approximately 117 pounds of necessary food staples to the Anne's Closet food pantry. We are still in need of your help, however, as we're currently running low on cans of corn and green beans. Your ongoing support enables St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church to continue providing aid to families in our community who find themselves in need. Again, and very sincerely, thank you. As always, every Sunday, please fill out the attendance pad at the end of your queue so we know that you are here to worship with us today. Good morning. It is a joy to be in worship with all of you this morning on this last Sunday of September. Next Sunday, just for Josh's sake, will be October 1st. And we will be celebrating World Communion Sunday that day. Most importantly, I hope you know that whether this is your first time or you have been attending for years, whether you're strong in your faith or you still have some questions, no matter your age, your tax bracket, your ability, or the color of your skin, no matter who you love or who loves you, you are welcome here. I invite you now to join me in our call to worship. Christ, the cornerstone, welcomes us to this house of God. May God's Spirit bless us with wisdom and faith. I invite you now to stand as you're able as we sing together, God, when we called our church by grace. Don't be scared. We will be singing it to the tune of My Hope is Built. I saw several looks of relief as I said that, so please stand as you're able.
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God, you give us commandments, not as a burden to bear, but as an invitation to the life you have for us. Grant us open hearts, ready to accept your invitation, that we might become a people who bear the fruit of the freedom and new life you give us. Amen. You may remain seated as we sing together hymn number 529. How firm a foundation. Today's scripture reading is found in Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. 
Please stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death, and lease the vineyard to other tenants, who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has begun, become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. Words of God for the people of God. Remembering Jesus, remember us. Over the last two weeks, we have loosened our grip on the things of our faith that have been digging so hard in our hands they have left impressions. We have opened our hearts to doubt and have recognized that doubt is not the opposite of faith, but it, it, it does indeed enliven our faith. We have remembered not only Jesus' death and resurrection, but the life that he lived. And in remembering that life he experienced through connection to Christ, we have been reminded to reorient ourselves toward God. We have been invited to learn the unforced rhythms So today we have more questions. Today we ask, what is the kingdom of God to you? <coughs> what beliefs do you hold about heaven and hell and who goes where? Just a disclaimer. You will never hear me preach a sermon on eternal damnation from this pulpit. And that is not where the sermon is going today. So if you feel tension with this question of what does it look like, what are your beliefs about heaven and hell and who goes where, live in that tension. Live in maybe that doubt. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like a treasure in a field. The kingdom 
kingdom of God is like a merchant searching for fine pearls. The kingdom of God is like a net thrown down into the sea. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God will be proclaimed throughout the world. The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, but it is already among you. As we ask these questions, what does it look like? for us to loosen our grip on these ideas of heaven and hell and judgment and who is going where. This morning, we heard the last parable in Matthew chapter 21. And in order to understand it more fully, we must first look back through this entire chapter. Because Matthew 21 starts with Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. This is Jesus of Nazareth. He enters into Jerusalem. Then he enters into the temple. And starts flipping the tables and driving out those who are buying and selling, saying, You have made my house a den of robbers. A blind man then enters and Jesus heals him. He then casually just curses a big tree on the side of the road as he's passing by. And then he re enters the temple the next day, begins teaching, and the chief priests and elders question his authority. By what and whose authority are you doing these things? He answers this question by reminding them that it is not who has or does not have the authority, but it is about who is actually following the will of God. And this question of authority is very much one that we ask of ourselves, of our church, of our country, of our world. Especially when it comes to thinking about who is in and who is out. But what we hear in the parable read today, as well as throughout the parables in Matthew, isn't actually about the judgment of people. It's not actually about passing judgment. But it is a challenge. A challenge to people so that they may love all, including their enemies, until the end. One's moral drive toward loving all or caring for God's world is not punishment or judgment. But by the love of God, which we have received. And I think, I think Christians have missed the point a little bit sometimes. I think we miss the point when we use scare tactics to recruit for the kingdom of God. I think we miss the point with our giant billboards asking, do you know where you'll spend eternity if you die today? What is the kingdom of God to you? What beliefs do you hold about heaven and hell and who goes where? These questions expand and invite us to ask ourselves, what is the role of the church? And the role of the church has been and always will be to preach the life and death and resurrection of Christ, providing a community of unconditional 
love inviting people to the table that Christ invites us to. And we're worried about the church, both our local church and our universal church. We worry about the number of people turning away from the church, declining numbers. We worry about the death of the church. But we don't look at death without the confidence of the resurrection. Rachel Held Evans says, And I can't help but think to myself, maybe a little death and resurrection is exactly what the church needs right now. Maybe this means that for Christians in North America, we're learning that Christianity isn't about empire. Maybe our empire building days are over. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe the church isn't about power and money and numbers. Maybe being the church is about something else. And maybe dying to the old ways of doing things is exactly what needs to happen. Maybe being the church is about something else. Maybe the church moves away from the overbearing injustice of controlling those who are producing fruit. Maybe the church moves away from power and control for the sake of power and control. Maybe the church moves away from claiming to be the hand of judgment. Because maybe just maybe, being the church is more than that. Being the church is inviting people to the table. Being the church is loving oneself, one's enemies as themselves. Being the church is loving God and loving neighbor with our body, soul, and mind. Being the church is about letting go of our inclination to determine who is in and who is out and simply leaving that up to God. Because that responsibility is far too great for us to bear. Maybe the church is about pushing back against structures that seek to maintain power over caring for people. So maybe some death of the church isn't a bad thing. Because death is never the end of the story. We are resurrection people. We are Easter people. We are people who proclaim that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We are people who proclaim an empty tomb. We are people who Christ has called out of the tomb. We are people who believe that Christ came for us when we ourselves were yet sinners, which proves God's love for us. With our hands open, we invite God into our beliefs. We invite God into our beliefs about heaven and hell. We invite God into our beliefs about the church. We invite God to open our beliefs to the fact that we have quite literally no say in final judgment.
to open our beliefs so that we might allow Christ to transform us, urging us to always err on the side of love. The parable ends with, the parable Jesus tells ends with the chief priests and Pharisees realizing that Jesus was talking about them. And they did not change their minds. Instead, they continued to plot ways so that they might kill Jesus. And so may we be open to having our minds changed so that we might better care for the world, the marginalized, and our enemies. May we be open to having our minds changed so that we might love God more fully with our heart, soul, and mind. May we be open to the humbleness that Christ extended to us when he knelt before his disciples and washed their feet. May we be open to be continuously changed by God. May we be open to all that God is doing in us. May we be open to all that God is doing in me and in you. May we be open to all that God is doing in this church, this community, and this world. Love the eternal one, your God, with everything that you have. All your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Amen. As we come to our time of prayer this morning, our full prayer can be found on the back of the bulletin. We also want to lift up Billy King, who had some spots removed from his head that have turned out to be malignant. And so we want to keep him in our prayers. We also want to keep Carol Heck's husband, David, in our prayers. He is in the hospital, uh, and they are monitoring his are there other joys and concerns this morning? <clears throat> Let us go to God in prayer. Oh God, we give you thanks for this day. For this community of people, for the gifts that they bring, for the love that they share. We give you thanks. We give you thanks that we are able to bear our hearts together. We hurt together and breathe together. We pray together. Oh God, we also experience great joy together. We give thanks for the generations that gather here to worship your name. We give you thanks for the ways that our gifts are used so that we might bear fruit for your kingdom. <coughs> oh God, we look up to you all prayers of our hearts. The ones that we name aloud and the ones that remain deep in our hearts. For you have searched our hearts and know us inside and out and you have called us good and there is nothing that we can do that will separate us from your mind. God, we give you thanks that you have called us your beloved children. And now, as your children, we pray together the prayer that Jesus first taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to the close of our service this morning, I invite you to stand as you are able, as we sing together hymn number 617, I Come With Joy.
to God, but eternal judgment is not ours. Thanks be to God that we have been called to love. Thanks be to God that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. Thanks be to God. Amen.